esta conferencia comenzará a grabarse. Good morning, Thomas. Good morning. How are you? Me? Fine. Yes, yes. Fine. Thank we you. can hear you. <laughs> we can hear you. Welcome. Right. And I will uh, try to. Do you have a presentation, Thomas? Yes. Okay. I will give you uh, the presentation rights in some in some moments. Okay. Just. Okay. Let me... Yes. No problem. Check here. Okay. So we have also with us today Joanna Sitsovska, and she is the head of unit of uh, automotive and mobility industries. I. Uh, yeah, I have seen her answer. Yeah. I don't see her yet, but it's a little soon yet. Sorry, because we are uh, using a new version of GoToMeeting. <laughs> I need to understand how this works. Guten Morgen, Ula. So, welcome everybody. Um, today we will uh, focus our session on on the um, European automotive ecosystem. Um, we will have with us uh, two experts that will introduce us uh, to this topic. Thomas Rohr from the European Automotive Cluster Network and Joanna Sichowska. Good morning. Good morning, it's, it's me, it's Joanna Sichowska speaking. Hello, how are you? Welcome, welcome, Joanna. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay. Uh, are you, are you uh, through phone? Are you connected through phone or? Through... Yes, I connected through phone because I couldn't uh, connect. I cannot connect my computer to the network. Uh, so I will do it via phone and I also have a colleague of mine. I wonder whether she has managed to join, Yvonne Kaiseler. She will also join by phone. Okay. I don't see any other person connected by phone, but we will, we will see. It's a little soon too. Okay. Uh, Joanna, I thought uh, that you could um, present your uh, unit uh, after the uh, introduction from Tomar Rohr, if you agree. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. Please guide me through the plan of the conversation and I will uh, do what, what will be good for you. Thank you. We, we will have three blocks. It typically, is the our structure, okay? The first block is something like 20 minutes long and will be about the, the conceptual framework for the session, okay? And we mm -hmm. uh, will go to other three, sorry, other three blocks, two blocks, one about disruption needs from the, from the area, okay? And the third one about uh, possible solutions. This is the proposal. 
in the on the second and third block we will have an open discussion between all um, the attendants but now we will start with the the first one um thomas yes the, thank you and the floor is yours i will give you the presentation rights yes um Okay, now you should see the screen. Yes, yes, yes. we are seeing your screen. So Perhaps you, could, you, you could keep the you could close the attendant list. Can you see the attendant list list too? Yes, ah. yes, and the problem is that's ah. too much space. Like this? I I am seeing it yet. Have okay, you closed because normally it's on the other it's on the other screen. Let me have a look again. Oh, sorry. Is it better like this? I continue seeing the, the other yes, uh, Thomas. I see the screen of the presentation of ESCN. Okay. Yes, it's visible. So I know this. Is, okay. So um, then let's start. Thank you very much for the invitation to present the European Automotive Cluster Network and our COVID-19 um, um, action. We call towards a new vision for the European automotive industry. So that's the name of our action. And uh, I have to change this one here. So what is the European Automotive Cluster Network? It has been founded or initiated in 2017. And uh, we started with uh, nine automotive clusters at that time. Today, there are 19 automotive clusters um, unified in the European Automotive Cluster Network coming from 10 European and international countries. So Russia and the others are from, from Europe. And we are representing something like more than 2,800 members. Most of them are companies and most of the companies are SMEs. Um, so um, we have a really strong representation of the automotive industry across Europe. And uh, in addition, six of the members of the initial founding members and called EACN for Joint Industrial Modernization Investments, uh, which is still running until now, the beginning of the next year. Um, the European, so EACN had been founded with a focus on um, industrial modernization. So that's the aim to collaborate in this field as we see a huge need, especially for tier two and tier three. Um, to, to work on this topic and the idea was that uh, together we are stronger and together our members are stronger and the four fields are product, production, process and people covering so the whole value chain. Okay, um, our COVID-19 action is the following. Um, so when COVID came up, we saw that uh, a lot of our members had huge difficulties. We've been very active in helping them or in activating them to, to mobilize masks and uh, protection systems for the hospitals and so on and so on, but they have their difficulties too. And so we set up, um, in April, we set up this action here with three uh, parallel working groups running at the moment. The first, the first one about the future vision, which is the one uh, I'm leading and the results I will present to you today are mainly the results coming from this working group. And we have two, two other working groups running. The first one is thinking about potential cluster services that can be um, trans, um, transposed to other clusters for existing ones or even new imaging new ones so that we can support our members and the third one that is um, analyzing the financial and human resource impact on the company and all these together shall 
uh, lead to a European automotive cluster network roadmap at the end of July, where we want to define um, a working program for the next years so that we can very efficiently <clears throat> support our members. In this first working group, we figured out nine theses or statements, which are more or less three um, corresponding to the uh, current situation, three with um, looking on the impact on the future products or the vehicle, and uh, and then some suggestions for the automotive industry in a in in a in a whole. So we'll go through those not not uh, not thesis by thesis, but uh, through the different uh, topics uh, during the rest of the presentation. The automotive industry, and that's not something we need to know, was st still facing a lot of trends and changings and um, impacts before the cor coronavirus came. As we all know, um, we're still working with uh, combustion engines, and uh, there is a trend to low carbon or a need to low carbon and zero carbon ability. And uh, this one, as a technological, a te technical, a technological trend, and uh, political trend, social trend is um, is uh, added with uh, social trends like millenniums that are not looking anymore for owning their own car, but looking for just to, to go from A to B. Uh, there we have the trade wars or conflicts, uh, especially between the US and China. Um, we have Brexit, we have uh, need to circulate e uh, economy and so on. So there are a lot of trends that, uh, that have been uh, there before the COVID, uh, COVID came and uh, which uh, put a, a certain pressure on the automotive industry to develop new, uh, new products and to adapt to this situation, including perhaps even new, um, new business models and so on. And then came the COVID virus, and we have here, um, <clears throat> the, we can see the evolution of car production and car registrations in, uh, in Europe based on, um, on data from, the, um, from ASEA. And we can see that uh, now in the first, first four months, last column, there's something like minus 15% of car production and minus 40% of car registrations in Europe due to the shutdown of production, shutdown of, uh, <clears throat> of agency where you could purchase your car and so on and so on and so on. And we are again at a level for car production, at least at the level of the 2008-2009 crisis. And the uh, automotive industry needed more or less 10 years to recover from this last crisis. And we again at the starting point from there. Um, the five, so in the UK, there are 2.5, nearly 2.5 million cars that have not been produced in uh, in the in the um, in the last four or four months. So these are additional impacts, and uh, you can imagine that difficult for the OEMs, and difficult for the tier one, but those they have some financial. Uh, buffer. Um, the, the crisis is much more um, visible with the subcontractors of tier two and tier three that do not have these financial margins. And now we have for the for the future, <clears throat> we have one evolution that's coming up. We can see here on the right uh, right side the results from a study from Germany. And you can see that during the uh, the shutdown and the, and the uh, confinement, uh, there have been something like 50% less travel distances. And uh, yeah, we can see the long distance train is the big loser of, uh, of the share. And the winners are the bicycle with, uh, with three times its uh, part than before and walking too. Um, public transport too has lost customers. The question now is, um, how fast and whether we are recovering these travels as we had before or not. If you look on studies and on, on experts, most people 
think that um, mobility or travels won't come back to the pre-crisis level, but then we will have something like 10 or perhaps even more um, percent less even in the future due to remaining telework and, um, and online conferences and so on and so on, especially in the peak hours. So this is a good sign for mobility and for the cities, but not, uh, not fourthly, a good sign for the automotive industry. The next generation of products will be electric, low or zero emission vehicles, and in our point of view, the automotive industry should focus on two technologies, which are the battery and the fuel cell electric vehicles. The first one for the short urban mobility, and the second one for intensive usages like taxis, ambulances, and so on, and long uh, and um, long distance travels, and also for all the heavy good vehicles and buses. So two different um, technologies in parallel, but two different technologies with uh, a lot of parts that can mutualize between both. So electric motors are the same. The power train is some, somehow uh, similar. And uh, these are not two really different technologies, but there's only yeah, the big batteries that will be replaced by a fuel cell and a hydrogen tank. <clears throat> this is the first thing. And I said, our suggestion is now really to focus on those, to put R&D effort on those two technologies and to push the development and deployment of these technologies from the European uh, OEMs. The second trend is uh, connected automotive and autonomous vehicles. This is not new, this is not new, but uh, this will come and uh, this will lead to probably less vehicles because we think that uh, once the vehicles are connected and especially autonomous, that um, they will have a lot of uh, like driverless taxis and people won't own their own car, but uh, use one when they want uh, to go for somewhere and uh, use it with others or alone. That's somehow the question, but the cars will run more, and uh, but there will be less. And in the transition phase, or um, the cars will be um, of two types. The first version of cars, we think those which will be proprietary to people will be much more uh, different, customized. And on the other hand, we will have fleets, autonomous fleets, automated fleets, uh, where we need a lot of cars with a similar or same uh, equipment. And that means that the production uh, system must become much more flexible and automated than it is today. It's still quite automated for the OEMs, that's right, but it's not yet automated for tier two, tier three, and so on. So they are the weak uh, elements in the value chain. And these changings for, uh, to, to electric mobility, to electric vehicles, whether they are with battery or fuel cell, uh, to autonomous cars and so on, um, makes it necessary that the OEMs start changing of um, looking for new skills. Tomorrow they won't need any more engineers for motors, for combustion engines, but they will need electric en engineers, electronics engineers, mechatronics engineers, and ICT specialists, because data and uh, captors and sensors and so on will become much more important than they are today. And it's time now to start changing this, uh, this uh, shift from uh, to, to these new skills. We also figured out somehow how we could imagine the future automotive industry could be organized to minimize the impact of crises like we've seen it today. Perhaps not if there's a, as a worldwide pandemic like this time, as this, as this time where everybody and in all parts of the world uh, production is shut down, then probably we can't 
do anything. But if there is a if there is an epidemic in one region, and especially in Asia, where the automotive industry is very dependent from today, um, <clears throat> then there are possibilities to uh, to uh, avoid to, to minimize the impact. And what we thought should be or could be a solution is that the automotive industry is organized in two, three, four huge uh, worldwide regions like America, Asia, Europe, as shown here in this uh, example. And each one of these regions is more or less autonomous with sourcing production and market. So a car produced for the European market is produced in Europe, a car produced for the American market is produced in America, and there are no, uh, no shipping anymore of full vehicles between the different regions. So this could be an idea to, uh, to think about how to organize, and then there are still some parts probably that need to be shipped from one region to the other one, but this shouldn't be um, high value and uh, critical parts. So this is an organization that is completely different from the one we have today, where plants uh, are specially specialized in one or two uh, models, and then these models are shipped um, around the world to the final market. Um, <clears throat> that means too that uh, that there must be um, that the value chain must become very strong uh, inside these regions, and uh, that means that we need again to enhance our tier two, tier three to join the supply chain and the digital supply chain. Uh, the OEMs and tier one still set up in the past, but we can't really see um, in the lower levels. And then strengthened European cooperation in R&D. So um, put the European actors together so that they can um, collaborate and develop high performance electric vehicles and, uh, <clears throat> and export this technology to the other regions to produce, to use them in these other regions um, for their products. So that's how we could imagine that the future automotive industry is. What does that mean? Last slide. So on the industry side, for us, some suggestions what they should do, uh, or what could be done is we, I think we, or we think that it's really necessary that the automotive industry decides on one or two powertrain technologies uh, now that will be pushed in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I don't know, until a new, even better technology is coming up and will replace this one again. But uh, we should stop having all these alternative fuel discussions and so on and, uh, and share the uh, R&D effort on, ten, on, on more different technologies but uh, without put, putting a real effort in one of those. Um, and then start really to switch all the R&D effort from the OEMs and tier one to these new uh, power selected powertrains. And as said before, we think that the best technology that is today available for the next years are battery and fuel cell um, electric powertrains. And we are convinced that if there is put an enough R&D effort in these technologies, then uh, there will be uh, significantly uh, advancements and uh, optimizations uh, possible. Then we need to push a real industrialization of zero emissions. If we hear that uh, governments are um, supporting customers to buy electric vehicles, and then on the other hand, that you can't order them anymore because there is no production capacity in Europe for these vehicles. It's some situation that we think should not be uh, existing anymore in a uh, in very, very close future. <clears throat> One other point uh, could be that uh, in, if actors getting European research funding, that there is somehow an obligation to produce the products based on these results in Europe too. So 
uh, yeah, give somehow back to Europe what Europe gave to the community. This could be something uh, to be imagined. And if we want to have the model I just presented before with regional uh, autonomous systems, then there is a need to consider the, the suppliers tier two, tier three as partners and not really and not as, as suppliers. Considering them as partners mean give them the possibility to invest in industrial modernization, uh, share information with them so that they can make um, a mid-term or long-term planning uh, of uh, products that will be needed, of uh, technology that will come up and so on and so on. And uh, don't consider them as uh, a supplier, you can just change if they're not, uh, not powerful in, uh, enough anymore. And then something is, <clears throat> the last one is, uh, what, we, what we learned today too is that especially these SMEs, these small SMEs that are in contact with different uh, customers, with this different uh, tier one generally, uh, the tier one are using different software tools and uh, the weakest element, those who have the le less money, they need to have different tools to be able to cooperate with their customers. And uh, they are not really using because uh, it's not their daily work, only if they are working with this customer. So they are not as skilled using this software and so on and so on. So it could be interesting to have an automotive uh, data exchange protocol that is mandatory for all software um, providers that want to uh, sell their software solution to the automotive industry. And then the uh, tier two, tier three can focus on one tool and use it in exchange with all the others without any problems of data um, of data exchange and so on. So this is something, some ideas, some think thinkings about from the uh, industry side. On the politics side, there's uh, one uh, one idea could be that um, yeah that the politics side instead of further tightening the emission regulation, so Euro 7, Euro 8, Euro 9, and so on. That means that the industry needs to put a huge effort on opti further optimize, optimizing these combustion engines to, um, to, to set quotas for zero or, or very low emission vehicles and, um, and to accept that uh, the motor technology for the next 10 years will not uh, be very much improved. It's something that could be uh, thought about. <clears throat> Second thing is that uh, once there is a, a real choose on these uh, one or two powertrain technologies that then the R&D focus that is, is that it's funded from the European Union within Horizon Europe, for example, should really focus on these technologies to help the industry to uh, to become again leader uh, in in the, with this technology, and um, the problem with electric vehicles is they are locally proper. But uh, if we look at the whole value chain, then we need to um, in how to say we need to we need to, uh, two corresponding green energy or hydrogen production and distribution. If we look on these technologies, if another one is chosen, then the energy. Uh, production and distribution for this technology must be uh, deployed. It cannot be that a region says we cannot set up a recharging infrastructure because our energy uh, distribution system is not uh, is not strong enough to do so. So this couldn't be possible. Um, all this needs to be fixed in 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 a roadmap over the next five to ten years, so that both sides, the vehicle industry as well as the energy uh, production and distribution are going in parallel and uh, being enabled to, uh, to work and to, to, uh, to allow millions of vehicles to, to run and to be recharged. And then accompany the industry and economic actors in the deployment of recharging infrastructures. So production distribution is one thing but th then we need the infrastructure, uh, the recharging infrastructures too. And this should not be only public investment, but uh, we need to, uh, to, to uh, lever uh, private 
investments in this in this field which are coming if the car side is uh, is grown and then on the consumer side yes buy electric vehicles or buy low emission vehicles i think this is the one thing that people can do but for this we need affordable electric vehicles if an, a vehicle with uh, with half of the autonomy costs more than uh, more than double of a combustion engine vehicle then this is not really possible for the majority of the people i stop here i hope that with these some ideas there's a good basis for the upcoming discussion and i thank you very much for your attention Thank you to you, uh, Thomas. You are really welcome. It has been a very uh, clear presentation. Congratulations. So uh, now we will give the word to Joanna Sitowska, head of unit of the automotive and mobility industries in DigiGrow. Joanna, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Thank you very much. Uh, Antonio, and thank you, Thomas. Since I am not connected uh, online, uh, please let me know if uh, you can hear me well, or if there are any problems, or I'm, am I too, am I, I'm too long, or or if you like me to uh, do other things in terms of housekeeping, because I really cannot see what's going on other than just talking to you, Antonio. So the um, sound is perfect. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Um, so first of all, good morning to everyone and thank you very much for inviting us to join this uh, discussion and to say a few words about what we are doing and maybe reflect and brainstorm and discuss about how we could uh, join forces in the efforts that are uh, very similar on both sides. When I listen to what Thomas said, I think we recognize um, very much our approach and our thinking about the future of the automotive industry. So I am aware you've been working in those clusters for quite some, time, quite some time now, and we will be very happy to uh, think with you whether there is any room for uh, joint action or at least joint reflection. So thanks a lot for uh, letting us be on this call. I have a few uh, comments that I would like to make to kick off or to contribute to the discussion and um, maybe the easiest would be to do it at least partially in reference to what Thomas presented because as I said it is uh, very much our thinking as well. Uh, what I should probably start by saying is that um, clearly over the past two or three months we have been very busy uh, thinking together with the industry, together with uh, our main partner associations, so ASEAN and CLEPA, but also with individual companies about what immediate or short emergency, short term emergency measures are needed in order to uh, help industry in this very specific or particular and difficult times. Now we are uh, trying to broaden the perspective and see mid and long term uh, what is it that is needed not only to uh, recover from uh, the COVID uh, situation but also to transform the industry and put it on a competitive uh, footing globally. So uh we we are running our reflection uh, reflection along those two lines on uh, the immediate uh, needs i think we are a bit passing this stage not that the situation is uh clear or that everything has already been done but our thinking is shifting more towards the next stage for the first uh, part of um, of uh, what we have done with industry, but also what the Commission has offered. I don't think I need to repeat the package of measures that have been adopted since March. These were mostly general measures, but also addressing a number of needs of the automotive industry. And uh, currently we are finalizing um, of uh, regulatory needs, 
that industry asks us to look at or uh, still some liquidity, demand stimulating measures, so uh, scrapping schemes or purchasing schemes. Thomas mentioned that in the context of support for the electric vehicles um, that uh, was offered by some member states. So we are, we are also thinking along these lines uh, in a sense that maybe there could be a possibility of uh, the EU stepping efforts by uh, adding kind of a new top up for the purchases of um, uh, alternative alter alternatively fueled vehicles. Uh, discussion is ongoing, so I wouldn't say much more, but this is simply to echo what we have heard earlier on. So um, this is uh, this is the first batch of uh, measures that we've been uh, thinking of. The second one is um, what is happening, what is going to happen with the industry um, in a couple of years from now. And I can only but agree with uh, Thomas saying that uh, the mega trends have been in place long before COVID. So uh, the COVID maybe has uh, impacted the, the intensity of thinking uh, mm -hmm. or the need to react fast. But obviously, we have been very well aware of working on those mega trends shaping the automotive industry uh, well before COVID. And um, electrification or any other alternative uh, powertrain discussion or automation or I would say more fundamentally and globally, changing business models and uh, looking uh, at the industry through the value chain approach has been uh, something that um, basically informed our work for the past two or three years. And we think we definitely need to focus our minds on uh, seeing how we can work in partnership with the industry, so with the industry and member states. When I talk about, when I say industry, I do not necessarily mean uh, the traditionally understood automotive value chain, but going beyond. And um, why do I say this? First of all, because um, when you analyze the recovery package, so what the Commission has offered, you clearly see that under the second pillar, so the InvestEU, there is an option and there is a possibility of uh, designing this kind of strategic value chains in areas where we think automotive should be more active or should build its presence. So there is, um, there is a political frame for this kind of uh, thinking and we have to exploit it uh, together with member states because this is the, um, the partnership both with the industry and the member states. And secondly, um, we already have a very good and very fruitful, uh, which is far more important example of uh, working on what we call a European Battery Alliance. Mm -hmm which means that uh, we have uh, an experience of how to design, uh, the, how to spot the need, how to design actions around those needs, stretching from uh, R&I through um, uh, raw materials, through processing, through production and deployment, and then uh, recycling when it comes to, to batteries. So we, we have developed this kind of horizontal thinking with variety of EU instruments and with engagement of traditional, but also helping to create new industrial players. And that's why I said we have to look beyond traditional partners in the automotive industry and see where the potential is. And I think uh, hearing what you said and so what I have managed to read before the meeting, that this kind of um, uh, bottom-up thinking is what we will need far more and I would say that uh, if we manage to have another conversation and get maybe into more details I would say this is a very good um, prognostics for uh, thinking about this way of, uh, of, of looking at changing business model building new value chain and focusing on the two main strengths which you said yourself was electrification slash um, fuel cells and automation. And maybe I will stop by saying one last uh, uh, thing, which is uh, apart from uh, developing and um, putting in place various building blocks of the, of the battery um, alliance, 
we have started reflecting on what needs there are and we should support on the side of the automation, not so much connectivity, but automation. So this is our next week's topic and we are uh, at the stage of, uh, of, of brainstorming. Um, once again, based on uh, work done already several years ago, but now we see, uh, we know better how to play with the notion of the value chain. And the, the very last point, uh, which I, I, might, I might have missed from the presentation of Thomas, but what, which we consider as horizontal and cross-cutting, uh, where we definitely need to work um, in agreement with the industry, are skills. So all this is, is, of course, extremely important, what we had said before, but uh, we see that if there are two bottlenecks, two fundamental bottlenecks for to carry this work forward, uh, one, it will always be a question of uh, financial support, and the other are skills. So um, this, is, uh, this is roughly what we do, what our thinking is. I realize it's not possible to say uh, more at this stage, but uh, I can only reiterate our willingness to engage with you on more specific basis once there are very um, precise questions, ideas, and uh, take forward this discussion. So I would say that that's it as a matter of introduction. And once again, thank you very much, Antonio, for letting uh, us uh, participate in this call. You are very, very welcome, Joanna. And I am totally sure that uh, we are open for that discussion, interested, very interested in that discussion. But Tomas, Tomas, I'm sure that you have comments. Yes, <clears throat> yes, thank you, Joanna, for for these uh, comments. I fully agree with you. And um, uh, I just wanted to, so don't need to 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 recommend and re, re um, um, Resay what I've said said before, but uh, I want to come back to what you said. Skills and financial support are the main barriers for the for the industry in the future. We fully agree. It was part of one of the slides that uh, there will be need for different skilled people in the future. In the future, um, and you mentioned the example of the uh, battery alliance, and you said that uh, you now have experience with find new actors for these new value chains. Um, we think that uh, there should be a different approach to not only looking for new actors, because we know that the future vehicles, especially if they are electric vehicles, will need different parts, less parts than today for the combustion engine, and different skills. And um, the, trans um, the transformation period will be quite long, so we won't have 100% uh, of electric cars tomorrow, but uh, in perhaps 10 or 12 or 15 years, I don't know, that all the cars, all new cars are electric. So there's some time, and we think that the actors that are today in the value chain should be enabled to follow this shift and to be enabled to switch to new products to new production um, processes or if they are not able uh, that we that we must help them to find new markets for their competences so um, in our idea we, we would not like to see the tier two tier three from today just put to the waste and replaced by other ones or we would like to have them enabled to follow this transformation process and to uh, remain part of the value chain and that's why we said consider them as partners and not as suppliers uh, because partners have the capacity to invest uh, in new production uh, systems uh, in automatization and have the capacity to, uh, to transform the existing skills and products and remain part of the value chain. So that's something what's very important for us um, and um, that needed to be highlighted. There will Thank be you. new actions too, that's, sure, that's for sure, because uh, someone who is doing um, metal parts today won't be a specialist for ICT systems tomorrow, but perhaps that they can find uh, markets in, uh, in the new electric vehicle uh, too. Thank you, Thomas.
I, I would like to stress also the importance of the standardization of data that you put in your in your uh, presentation. In my experience, it's very very important. Anyway, there are other uh, attendants here that are expert on on your area, and I would like to hear you. Okay, it's the the floor is open for everyone. We have 20 minutes to share opinions, uh, knowledge, experiences. Who is interested in in speak? Hello, uh, can Hello. you hear me? This is uh, Dmitry Moisinko from a cluster of, of automotive industry, uh, Russia. Uh, I would like to uh, ask question to our experts. Uh, uh, our cluster joined EISN network uh, last year. And um, so I took a part uh, in uh, this uh, work group uh, uh, to prepare the presentation that um, Thomas uh, presented today. Uh, um, Thomas, uh, so you mentioned that uh, uh, the shared mobility uh, in some uh, slides is, is also an uh, important uh, trend. Uh, uh, I would like to note that uh, um, in Moscow, in uh, the car sharing uh, economy um, started in uh, 2017. And now, where is more than 10 operators and um, is more than uh, uh, 20 hundred uh, cars registered uh, in Moscow. But uh, this uh, crisis uh, changed uh, the situation and car sharing market dropped by uh, 60 percent uh, in Moscow during these three, three months. Uh, so, uh, how the situation in France, uh, in your opinion, will the pandemic change uh, the market in the future, or it will uh, have uh, just a short uh, impact? I think this is an important uh, thing to note, uh, as I see in the questions on the right uh, side of, of um, uh, of the screen, so uh, probably this pandemic will also change uh, the behavior of uh, citizens and um, owning uh, the car. So will be also one of the trend in the in the future. Uh, so because it's the freedom, comfort, and security, or or am I wrong, Thomas? How do you think? Um, yes, yeah, thank you, Dimitri, for, for your question. Um, I think there are two, two elements. The first one is that there is a long a long term trend now that young gender generations are not doing their driving license automatically as we have done in the past. And they are much more flexible when they want to go from one point to another point using um, services like blah blah car trains uh, buses and so on and so on um much more young people that are not owning anymore an own car at least here in 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 france and in europe in in, in europe this is this is a trend and shared mobility like car sharing that what what you speak about um is one part of the offers they are using um it's right that uh, COVID has an impact on uh, on this type of service because people fear uh, somehow contamination if they use a car someone else they don't know had used just before and so on. So that means that there will be a need uh, for um, better cleaning, disinfect disinfectation of this type of vehicles, and uh, there's probably a little bit more service needed from the uh, operators uh, than it has been in the past. But uh, there too, uh, this, is, this isn't something we haven't really discussed in, uh, in depth. But my personal opinion is that uh, within six months, one year later, uh, people won't really care anymore about this one. Yeah? And then they have their disinfectation, uh, hydroalcohol um, uh, solutions with them 
and, and use them if they're really angry. And uh, so I, I think it's, uh, there, there is a, um, a peak, down peak now, but this will come back uh, quite rapidly, I think, this is my personal opinion. But it's the same for public transport, it's the same for trains and so on and so on. Today, people are fearing using them, so that's why the share is going down. And, uh, and the masks is one, uh, one solution, one action to help people getting a little bit um, uh, confidence back for these, these transport system. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether we'll come back to the situations we know from Paris and probably Russia and so on, where people are really crowded in, in the uh, public transport or not. I said that uh, due to telework and so on, experts ex um, uh, expect uh, something like around 10 or even more percent less traffic during the peak hours. This will help public transport too to become a little bit more comfortable and. Um, if there's not a second wave, then I think that uh, in one in one year we will come back to somehow um, usual um, behaviors that we have be, we have had before. But that's my personal opinion because we had not time, uh, we did not discuss this question inside our network. Thank you. Any other comments? Questions, new ideas? <clears throat> there are some questions, some comments on the in the in the comment section. Are there questions? Uh, in the chat, yes. But I, I would like to hear yeah. people <laughs> from the, the don't be shy, please. Especially if you have other proposals. There are a lot of people here. I was surprised by the number of employees in the in your slides. So uh, the, the numbers of employees are uh, direct uh, direct uh, employment to in the in the sector by uh, county. Ah, uh, in, in, in this in this uh, in this chart, um, <clears throat> these are um, data from ASEA, and they say these are the direct employment for in the automotive industry. So those who are actively contributing to the production of cars, uh, what do they see, cars, trucks, wines, buses, and coaches, yes. Thank you. So these are publi publicly available data on the ASEA website. Okay. Okay, Tomas, do you have a comment in the chat? Will you, will you, sorry, Tomas, no, Christophe, will you comment, will you share? Christophe Christovski. Can you share your ideas? I see that you don't have sound. Christophe? Okay, Thomas, uh, sorry, yeah. Christophe. I think yeah. that he has some problem, technical problem, it seems because the sound is disactivated. Yes, yes. Okay, uh, Aurora. Well, apart from the question I put on the chat, um, I also worry about the changes in the production in terms of, of hours, because if everyone goes on car to work, the roads will, will not be enough on the places where uh, the, the the work cannot be done remotely. I mean, the, the diminishing of the number of cars that uh, your study shows is not equal in all the activities. So if, if uh, I can work at home uh, because I don't have a physical 
task on on factories it, it's not the case so the, the the people for factories if they all bring cars the roads will be a nightmare and parking will be <laughs> needed uh, largely so i don't know if there is any study about that um i i don't i don't have knowledge about studies about this and it's probably much too early to have uh, um to have valuable uh, feedback or returns or experiences about about this because today um traffic is coming back because confinement has has finished now and we will see with now opening of the borders whether the long travel this long distance travels um will come back as they have been in the past too we've seen in one of the slides with from the german uh, study that long distance travels were those who uh, who dropped the most so um it's it's much it's it's too early today to say what will really happen in the and I think we, we must distinguish between a very between a short term a future. So let's say something like the one year after the real end of the pandemic. We don't know whether there will be a second wave. We don't hope it, but uh, it's still possible. And um, and is there so one year after the real end of the of the um, of the pandemic? Um, in this first period. Probably people who have a car will use it a little bit more, but then the people will come back. And um, if we still have 10% less people, because an average of 10% people remaining at home, working at home, or just coming for at uh, at lunchtime to the office in the morning, so the problem for street capacities is peak hour. And if, you, if the crisis helps to reduce the overall traffic of 10% during the peak hours, I think then um, we still won a lot, a lot, a lot uh, for the whole mobility uh, system. Um, you're right. There are people who cannot do telework, um, and uh, we will we will see how they come to work. I think it's much too early today to 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 really. Um, have a conclusion, a uh, uh, final, final answer to this question. Thank you, Thomas. Okay, any mm -hmm. other comment or question? Antonio, can I make a brief question to, to Thomas? Thomas, it was very interesting uh, in your presentation, that idea that you proposed that in the future, the organization of the auto um, area in the world should be different with three areas and another value chain. Do you think that it, that will be possible without a new political order, new kind of real regulation from the institutions like the European Commission and others? What do you think about that? This is very impractical or do you think it will be very difficult to implement this new proposal that you make? Um, it's a very good question. I don't have really an answer. To this because we are only only clusters so we had this idea of organization but it's not up to us to to implement it so um i think if the automotive industry accepts somehow this type of organization then it could be possible but it will take a lot of time so it's not done in one or two years it will probably need five to ten ten years um because that means too that you must enable the production sites in each one of these regions to produce every type of model. So production systems, assembly lines must become much more flexible and, and perhaps even more automated and so on. So these are huge investments and uh, strategic decisions that need to be taken. Um, that will cost some money too. And uh, that's why I'm not sure whether your whether your automotive industry will go into this direction. But if they go into this direction, then very very slowly, when they have to do investments, that they enable the system um, step by step to become uh, more independent from other regions. So um, it was one idea. It was one idea. We think somehow interesting whether it's feasible. Whether, you're, whether the industry, the automotive industry, is uh, following or considering this type of, um, of uh, idea, 
I don't know, we did not discuss this with the OEMs and this is a strategic definition or um, decision from the OEMs. I know from all the others, the others uh, are just followers. Uh, so um, yeah, this could be a dis interesting discussion with, with them, but I think it will be a very long process to go there if they really accept it. And then the question is today, everybody's considering risks from the globalization on, this, uh, on the supply chains, but um, if pandemic is, uh, is gone and if in the next five years we won't have any problems anymore, um, do we still consider the risk in the same, matter, uh, same way we consider it today? Or is money the only thing that will be in the focus in five years again, as it has been in the past? So very difficult question, but as you said, uh, we think that this type of organization could help to make the whole system uh, a little bit more stable and um, and uh, strong against crises in some regions of the world. Perfect. So it's time to start uh, closing the session. I first of all I will say uh, to Joanna that I think that we are totally open to uh, meet again and and continue discussion the discussion in a deeper way okay um so it's i will i will say please suggest us when and how to do that okay um that's uh, first also from the side of the uh what we are doing in the European Cluster Alliance, we have decided to create an expert group on automotive. Uh, so whoever is interested uh, is invited to to participate. Okay, on it uh, we are planning a, a meeting soon of, of this expert group. Okay, you know that we are creating expert group on different areas because we are studying the different uh, industrial ecosystems and for some practice we will meet also for agri-food and others okay um, and you are also invited to to fulfill the um, survey that we publish uh, about uh, the the disruptions on the different ecosystems we haven't spoken today too much about disruptions okay uh but it was important to to put over the table proposals and it has been the focus for today congratulations uh to thomas and the european automotive cluster network for what you have been doing and you are doing in planifying the the future and you are invited also to join us uh, tomorrow tomorrow we will speak about the um, sorry, uh, a presentation of the social economy canvas. I want also to, to stress that uh, we have to, we are going to meet daily, okay, but we have two very, very special uh, sessions. Um, one is planified for next Monday. It will be two hours long and we have to title it uh, towards a green and collaborative European recovery. Um, this topic of today, near every topic is related to that green recovery, okay? And the, the second very special session is, uh, it will take place on Tuesday 30, it's at uh, 3 p.m. Central European time, it's a dialogue with the Commissioner Thierry Breton, okay? Uh, and it will be one hour long and it will be our opportunity to explain the commissioner what we are doing from from our side from our color collaborative uh, perspective and what can what can we uh, uh, do for the next uh, European priorities, okay? So you are also invited to join that that meeting. Um, and with that, thank you, thank you, Tomas, thank you, Joanna, thank you, everybody.
and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Antonio. Thank and you, we'll Antonio. stay in touch. Thank you for this opportunity to, to friend European Automotive Class Network. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you.